Hey, and welcome to our monthly interview uh, for Mentorship Plus. And today I have a friend of mine, a fellow traveler, expedition guide, and uh, photographer, Dave Sanford, uh, with me. Uh, hey, Dave, thanks for joining me. Hi, Ron. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I, I've been looking forward to this ever since, since I, I, I reached out and you said, yes, you, you'd like to do an interview. It's like, uh, I'm so grateful whenever somebody I've actually traveled with and, and, and experienced how you work and how you see things and, and just uh, the way you run your day when you're out in the field. I get really excited to be able to share that with my community and then uh, uh, with the wider world later on YouTube. Um, you, you're, you're, you're kind of famous for a couple of reasons. You've, you've had your moments of fame. And I'm going to share with you, one of them is your liquid mountains. And I'm going to screen share, and I'm just going to ask you to give us a little bit of commentary before we dive into some more adventures. But first, I want to share a story because I'm also a storyteller. I was booked, I think it was the Northwest Passage with One Ocean Expeditions. And uh, I had some other bookings and we were trying to get things nailed in. And I got a phone call saying I'd been bumped. There's this, this guy, Dave, who's, who's ha having this window of, of uh, fame because of these amazing images and book that he released. And we'd like to get him on board. And so it's like, yeah, whatever, like I'll do whatever. And that was you, I, and we hadn't met yet. And so our unofficial meeting was I got bumped from a trip and you got to take it. So, but in the end, it's okay because we ended up on a trip together where you were actually first, I think a passenger to go and shoot for yourself. And I was, I was an expedition, a symposium guide. I think that's how it all worked out. But yeah, that was. was the beginning. Yeah, yeah it was. I. <laughs> If you told me that, I honestly, I do not recall or remember. And now I, and I, I feel terrible that I was the reason for you to not go on a trip. Oh, um, it was it was OK because I, I got shuffled. I, I was still on Svalbard. I was still on Antarctica. We're all good. I was just hoping I haven't done a Canadian trip up until last or in 2019 when I went to the East Coast. But, right. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, no, it, it was fine. We, we still then, had, yeah. had everything, you know, stamped and green stamped. And right. However they do it. And you then know, yeah, Nanama, our our friend Nanama, one of our doctors, yeah. she she was taking her father to Svalbard and he couldn't go. So she had a free spot in her cabin. So all I had to do was get myself there. So yeah. uh, having worked for One Ocean, knowing all the ins and outs, it was just, yeah, I just kind of slid right in there too. <laughs> yeah. And on that trip, uh, it was almost like you were one of the symposium team. In fact, I think one of our symposium team members couldn't make it. And you just kind of seamlessly fit in there. You might have even done a presentation for us. I don't recall exactly, but you just became one of the team and uh, uh, clearly uh, now a friend. So that was a great experience. We're going to talk about uh, airplanes and, and uh, snow geese and how to get home when you're stranded in a little while. But first, I'm going to do a screen share. And uh, this, is, this is how I first got to know about you was uh, Liquid Mountains. And this is an article in Lens Culture. And uh, this is where I'm, I've gone to share some of the images, but they're powerful, powerful images. Tell us a little bit about how this came about. Thank you. Um, so I, I've been very familiar with Lake Erie growing up pretty close to it and uh, spending a lot of time along its shoreline and or on Lake Erie. I had a cousin that had a cottage down at Turkey Point and I used to do a lot of fishing. And um, so I was very familiar with Erie and how quickly it can turn and whip up into what you see here in these images. And um, it wasn't until um, about six years ago or so, six, seven years ago that I had finally acquired the right equipment to be able to, to, to photograph this in the way I'd sort of envisioned. Um, I you know, prior to that, I just didn't have the gear to, to be able to do this the way that I had hoped to, um, both the water housing stuff and longer lenses to shoot from shore. Uh, so in 2015, uh, I, that's when I basically started my, my wave photography or underwater photography uh, over in Australia. And I really got the bug for it. And I was mentored um, by my good friend, Warren Keelan, who's an amazing ocean photographer. And about six months after that, I was just really missing being in the water. And this is the, now we're into the fall of 2015. And this is when we get the Great Lakes storm season where you get these huge waves on, on the lake. 
And um, so, yeah, I, I kept an eye on the weather and the forecasts, and I started to study this stuff and know, you know, what particular forecasts are going to provide me with the best opportunity to, to go out and see this and, and create images in these conditions. So um, I'll never forget the first time I went and did it. Uh, my parents happened to be in Australia and my, my, they called me on my way home from Lake Erie knowing that I was going and asked me how it, it went. And I was like, oh, it was great. I got some really cool stuff. It's just incredible. And, but I was like, I don't know how people will, you know, receive this because it's, it's dark and moody and stormy and it's not the nice bluey green turquoisey waves that a lot of people are drawn to. So uh, I loved it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to throw it out there. And I started putting it out onto my social media and within a matter of days, um, you know, a lot of people started gravitating to it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and then I, I did an article for board Panda and that went viral and literally within a matter of, of a couple of weeks of photographing this, it just started blowing up all around the world and that completely transformed my career. Yeah. I, I have a question about some of the images. I spend a lot of time on the water. I always have, I, I love sailing. I love windsurfing. I love water sports. Uh, I love expeditions. It seems to me some of the magic in these these waves is the waves are moving in one direction and the wind is moving in another. How does how does that happen? Like that's so bizarre to me. Like when I look at these images and I see the the conflict of wind and wave and and just this this battle of momentum. It's, it's, it's nice that you pick up on that because a, a lot of people don't, mm -hmm. um, you know. And but you're so familiar with with water and, and the conditions and sailing and everything. So. Um, that's what's amazing is a lot of people look at these and you would think that generally the wave is moving in the direction that you see it curling. Uh, yeah. That's the complete opposite with these, um, as you say. And, and the reason being um, the winds are driving the, you know, the, the winds are driving the water and the waves in one direction. And where I'm shooting, I am shooting waves that are essentially refracting off of a pier and meeting up with the, you know, the original line the of waves coming in. Oh, so okay. the waves come in at a particular height, they hit this pier and then refract back out. And because the, they go from such deep water to shallow water and where this refraction is and where they start to move back out, um, essentially what you need is the perfect timing where I guess a wave hits, refracts and starts to move back out and has that the, the same speed and momentum and, and the right trough, I guess, to hit another wave head on. And that's why you see these wow. crazy explosions. Okay. So the water essentially has nowhere to go, but up because you go from 60 some odd feet to about maybe 10 to 15 feet in a very quick, you know, drop off. So as yeah. I say, the water collides and has nowhere to move, but up and you get all these twists and turns and everything. And the wind just blows the stuff backwards. It's, it's wow. absolutely phenomenal to watch unfold. Wow. I'm going to come back. There's so much I want to cover today, but um, yeah, what a, what a great experience that must be. And, and you say getting the right gear, understanding weather, and then even finding the right locations and circumstances for these things to take place. Uh, it's, it's very good work. And clearly this has led to a lot of opportunities uh, for you. And uh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Just wonderful. Very, very artistic. Um, I am going to encourage people to, to look you up and follow, you know, Dave, St 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 uh, pardon me, Dave Sanford, international photographer on your uh, website. And, and I'll share the links uh, in, in the, when we share this on YouTube. Thank you. But, um, I want to uh, talk about, before I share more images, I, I want to talk about, uh, we officially met um, in uh, Svalbard, in the Arctic, uh, Norway's Arctic uh, archipelago of Svalbard. And, um, uh, you know, when you get a group of photographers who just absolutely adore nature and wildlife photography and um, teaching and, 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 and helping others get great images and you get this environment going on a, a place where you literally from the time you wake up to the time you fall down every day, that's what you're doing. What a great experience we've had. Um, how, how many trips, polar trips have you taken, Dave, yourself? Uh... I was trying to do this math in my head the other day. I think it's around 16 or 17 now. Wow. Uh, yeah. if, I guess if you say polar, then I could say 17 or 18 if you count Antarctica. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's polar. Um, so, yeah. Yes. So yeah. Uh, yeah. 17 or 18 times, I guess now. 
which That's is fantastic. Crazy. To me. What's, yeah. what's your favorite North or South? <laughs> That's so hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I will, I will lean, I will lean towards the Arctic only because they have something Antarctica does it and that's polar bears. Yeah. I thought polar bears, cause we're going to get to that too. You love yeah, polar so bears. I do. And, uh, and uh, so yeah, I would, I would have to pick the Arctic if, if you're going to force me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mine's Antarctica. Uh, it's something from the first time that was my first trip uh, polar expedition was Antarctica and it just grabbed me like nothing I've ever experienced as far as and, location like I mean just you know with the overall um yeah I mean I'll, I'll say Antarctica like when people ask me what's the the greatest place or most amazing place I've ever been on a, and that is my answer Antarctica yeah it's the, yeah, the my, polar bears that win the Arctic. <clears throat> Yeah, emotionally, this emotional overwhelm happened in Antarctica for me. And it was, it's literally sensory overload to see a wilderness that's so extreme. It is. Um, I've got chills going down my spine right now just talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I am, I'm going to uh, do some screen sharing over in Lightroom and, and I'd like to carry on the conversation over there. Um, and, and before I do that, um, we had a, an incredible polar bear experience one of my well it was my best ever polar bear experience uh during expedition together i don't know what you named her i named her jackie the jumping bear everybody named her something uh she was a very uh very very uh amicable bear that loved to jump ice pans and was just insatiably curious and hung around i forget how long quite a while hung two around ice hours. pans around the ship two and a half hours of shooting for for jackie and um that, that was Lucy. Okay, Lucy. I call her Jackie. Yeah, I, I called her Lucy. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a gorgeous uh, uh, bear, probably on her first summer on her own. She was thin, but not unhealthy. And she had just missed getting a seal. We got to witness her stalk a seal. And two just seals. Miss. And, yeah, two seals. And uh, I remember Dave McEwen had that on video and seeing just literally just missed it. And the, to witness a polar bear, from, it seemed like a mile away when it first picked up the seal scent and, and probably a mile away from us, it was so far away. And we slowly moved toward her and she slowly moved toward the seal. And she was still quite a ways away when she disappeared underwater. And then it's like everyone was holding their breath like they knew that moment was gonna happen. And she exploded out of the water and charged the seal and the seal just, just got down the hole when she, she just missed it. And we, some of us were cheering for the seal. Some of us were cheering for the bear. <laughs> but after that, she kind of looked up and said, oh, there's a monstrous, nice smelling white iceberg right there with people on it. I'm going to go check it out. So <laughs> that was our ship. Anyway, I'm going, to, she, I'm going to do the screen share. And She was incredible. As you say, that, that will always be one of my coolest wildlife encounters. Um, you know, you, it, it, she did everything except juggle, essentially. Um, yeah, I, I could see, she put yeah, on a show. She did everything true. we could ever imagine, um, you know, wanting a wild animal to, to do for you, you know, providing you with yeah. the, such a variety of, of imagery and moments and, you know, being able to switch out lenses and get different focal lengths and try different things. And, um, yeah, she was just, uh, incredible there she is right there yeah let me like, i was gonna say yeah i know you got that big wide out and i remember this uh this so so well and she was an expert at jumping these ice pans um so this is her we'll call her lucy today lucy the jumping bear. And you can see that she is thin thin but uh, uh it looked to me like she's pretty pretty skilled she's gonna get a seal and she i think she's gonna be fine or she was fine and uh that was uh just such a memorable trip uh, it, it, it was uh, and Svalbard is, is my favorite part of the Arctic because I think that's you know it's sort of where Antarctica kind of meets the Arctic I guess you would say as far as the landscape goes I know it's not as yeah on uh, as a grand of a scale but um you know it's it's quite similar with the mountains and glaciers and um you know and just I guess the the, the quiet peacefulness of it as well so 
Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about bears. There's, there's a, a variety of bear images I want to go through, and then we'll get back to some others. But uh, just to let the people know, besides the waves, and now we know uh, polar bears, but bears in general, sharks, penguins, whales, I mean, and then our native wildlife here in Ontario, Canada. But I want to I want to take a look at the bears because you you have some just incredibly spectacular bear shots. And there's only two photographers I know of that capture character so well, and that's you and Daisy, Daisy Gillardini. Um, you, you both have a knack for really capturing character in wildlife. Uh, so I'm gonna, well, as you- th Thank you, Ron. Go that, through these. that comment means the world to me. Um, I have huge respect for Daisy and, um, and her, her talents and, um, that that means a lot coming from you. So so thank you. You're welcome, and it's true. And people will see as as we scan through these. Uh, one of the experiences we share as photographer is as photographers is not simply taking a picture of what something looks like, but what it really is, like that that whole character idea. And so uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to show uh, these bare images all of your images, but as we see with the bear, that every image is, re it reveals character. And to me reveals that you're, you're not just a master of the vision, but a master of your gear, knowing how fast your shutter speed needs to be, knowing your focal length, knowing how to track motion, like all of these things, these technical things have to be learned so well that you don't really think about them too much, that you just know what, what to do to, so that you're ready for the real moment. Can you, can you share with me this kind of experience of anticipating that moment? Yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right in all of those things. And, um, you know, the, the short answer sort of, or short comment on that is, is practice makes perfect. You know, the, the yeah. more you do something, the better you're going to get at it. And sort of my approach to um, all the subjects that I photograph, um, you know, whether it's my wildlife or it's my sports side of my career, um, I try to learn as much as I possibly can about them. Um, and when it's something that you love, it certainly makes it easy and fun to learn about them. I want to learn about them. It's not a chore to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of reading, um, watching videos, being around experts that, you know, when you're working on the expedition ship, you get to work with all these, you know, biologists and scientists and researchers. So you, you learn from simply being around them. And then there's the, the firsthand experience of being in the, you know, in the field and, and learning and observing for yourself. So all those things kind of, you know, come into play um, when I'm out shooting. And, and as I say, you, you, you learn those things, but then you, you apply them so much that it, it becomes second nature. You know, um, I think I, I pride myself on the act, you know, my action photos and, and kind of, as you say, you mentioned before, um, trying to, to make people feel like they're there or feel like they, they have a connection with my subject. Um, because I know that when I'm out in the field, I do, um, I've had this ever since I've been a kid, I've had a real fortunate connection with animals, be it pets or, or animals in the wild. I, I don't know if it's just how I handle myself or what, but I've just been so fortunate that way. And I, I honestly think that that plays to my advantage when I'm in the field. Um, oh, you know, I so agree. I, I don't I'll know what it you. is, but. Yeah. I'll share with you and the, and the, and the, uh, the people that watch this, this is something I hear from world-class uh, wildlife photographers, and you see it in the work, it, it is this idea that it's, it's more than just being there. there there's a, a level of connection. I, I photographed with, and I don't consider myself a world-class wildlife photographer. I love photographing wildlife, but you guys, you guys take it to a level I have not achieved. And there is this connection that I see happen. It's like, wow, like, did I just watch that unfold? It's it's incredible to see in the field when this happens. I've seen it with Daisy. I've seen it with Guts, Gerhard, and I've seen it with you. And speaking of Guts, our, our friend Gerhard Swanopel of uh, Pangolin Photo Safaris, one of the techniques he does, he, he challenges us to think differently. And, and he loves this kind of photography, this, this getting it in camera. Um, share, share with us the, the technique behind this for those who are, are photographers, maybe a bit newer and 
and don't realize how extreme you can shoot, what, what would you have done with this shot? What's, what's the ideal condition? So the, this particular shot is um, with the, this rim lighting. Um, this is basically something that I like to do when the sun is kind of uh, high in the air. It doesn't have to necessarily be straight overhead or anything, but your subject is strongly backlit. And you've got uh, a situation like I had here where you have sort of a, a river bank that was almost, you know, straight up vertical uh, mm -hmm. in the background. And because the sun was high and behind that, it fell to, to like a nice dark shaded area. So essentially what I do in these types of situations is because it's not the prettiest light, you know, if you're just looking at it through a normal exposure, um, it's kind of washed out and blown out and you lose some of the details. So what I do is I just expose for those highlights that are, are that make up that rim light around the, the edge of the bear and the, the light, you know, being illuminated from overhead and behind and the fur. So what I essentially do is, is get my shutter speed as high as I can at an 8,000th of a second. And then I bring my ISO speed right down to a hundredth of a sec or a hundred ISO. Yeah. Uh, if I can do that. And then from there, I'll adjust my aperture, um, you know, to whatever is necessary to give me this nice, you know, rich, dark, black, you know, uh, backdrop yeah. and, and, and silhouette of the animal. And essentially, all you're doing is exposing for those highlights. So now on this particular one, the bear was walking right along the edge of the, the river. So I did have um, those sparkly diamond kind of type highlights um, at the bear's feet. And yeah. I originally kept it in and I thought, you know, just for the simplicity of this, I, I liked it better without it. So I did have to do, you know, a little, little burning and dodging um, to, to get rid of that. But that's in yeah. a nutshell, basically how I create these images. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. I know when I've done this, um, the the exposure value drop from what would be considered a, a normal image could be, you know, easily five stops under exposure, according to the camera, to get that right. just right. But I, it's important to focus on on this detail, making sure that you don't blow that out. So that's that's your you know you're you're just focused on getting that exposed well, and the rest can just go away. Yeah. And it's just one of those things when a lot of people are like, oh, the light's crappy. I'm putting the camera away. I'm like, uh, -uh. Yeah, there's yeah. always a way I no, think you can a, manip a manipulate the yeah. light. So, yeah. yeah. This is great. Um, I, I suspect you're not holding the camera lying down saying hi, Yogi, on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not quite. No, this is this is captured with a remote camera. Um, and I was about uh, anywhere between maybe 50 and hundred feet away from from yeah. these bears at the time and uh i yeah as i say i had the the camera and a, a remote camera set up in a housing um, along the the river's edge and i had a, a hard wire cable that i buried yeah. and ran over to me and this was i basically just from observing the bears um after a, a day or so this was a, a spot in the creek that they frequently you know brought their their catch out to eat so yeah. I, I knew it was a high traffic um area mm -hmm. so therefore it increases the odds of, of capturing a, a decent image yeah wow like i said about character it's you can see the character in every one of the images i'm going to scan through a couple move on i i just re really want to get back well action of course is 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 phenomenal getting the, these moments um yeah you know you must when when a when a scene explodes like this, you're not sure you nailed it. Like you're just, it happens so fast, at least for me anyway. Fast. Yes, it does. Uh, the great I, thing about this particular scene though, is I had about 45 minutes uh, with these two. And, oh, wow. Um, wow. you know, so it allows you to sort of, you know, you don't know, obviously you don't know how long you're going to have, whether you have 30 seconds or whether you have 30 minutes, but um, I was very fortunate in this particular scenario. These bears were were so relaxed and chill. I'm I'm in the water with them. I'm I'm down at water yeah, level, and wow. they're, you know, they're going about their business. And and because they did for so long, it provided plenty of opportunities. So um, we'll we'll carry on, but I want to mention that uh, idea of eye level. Eye level. I say eye level or below. How important is that to you? 
It's hugely important to me. Um, it's something that I've always, you know, kind of, uh, if, I, if I can do it, I do it. Um, I just think it makes a big difference when, when you can get down to the level of your subject and, or as you say, even below it, especially when you have, um, you know, animals like bears, which are, are you know, big burly predators. Um, I yeah. think it, you know, especially for some of the characters, it really, it just helps to show that, you know, showcase that character of a larger than life figure. Yeah. As it has here, uh, you can, you can see, I'll just bring my mouse over how close you are to the ground and, and shooting through the foreground and the expression, just the look on that bear, like the eye. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot, and that's the thing I know in wildlife, a lot of people, there's, there's a lot of people that like the idea of an image where the animal isn't connecting with the photographer. Um, I, myself, I love it. I, I, I like the fact that you can be in the wild and you have this kind of momentary connection with, with this incredible being that recognizes that you are in their home, you know, and, um, in a lot of my images, you can see that, that there's, there is a connection with that animal looking directly at me and, and recognizing that, yes, I am indeed there, you know, um, yeah. I don't think it all has to be this, you know, notion of like, oh, the animal shouldn't know we're here, or that we exist, you know, because we do. Yeah. So. yeah. And we are in that environment where maybe an observer, but we're there and, and I, I'm with you. I, I do like to have connection with all my subjects in, you know, in the studio or in the wild, I, I like to have some connection with what I'm photographing. Absolutely. Um, so the Arctic, you mentioned the Arctic and I just wanted to kind of bounce this off. Uh, um, but there was two things I was gonna cover. One was the word pivot. Um, this year, well, like you said, since mid 2019, we, we've been under as, as photographers, uh, We've been under an incredible pivot, uh, and then moving. Uh, we unfortunately were were part of a an unfortunate collapse of one ocean expeditions, and so um, that was unfortunate and led us into a bad end of 2019. And then just when we thought things were going to improve, like you had mentioned before, you were thinking of going to Australia after an Antarctic trip, and um, COVID hit, and so pivot is a massive word for us as photographers right now. Uh, I had to pivot, I had to move toward my membership. uh, uh, Some of them are here with us today and um, the studio closed, travel closed. Um, I didn't get my 2019 trips. And um, yeah, it was quite a thing. What what things have worked for you and what things do you kind of, kind of mourn over losing throughout this COVID period? So, yeah, pivot's a good word for this. Um, and uh, as far as like, uh, I guess there, there are a lot of things that were lost, um, but I don't, I don't like to focus on the negative. I don't like to dwell on, yeah. you know, what was or what you, what could have been. Um, mm-hmm. But it, you can't help but think about it. Um, you know, I had off the top of my head, it was something like nine assignments in you know, between Antarctica, Alaska, the high Arctic, Svalbard, Australia, um, and other parts of North America, uh, Norway, um, everything just like yeah. all canceled last March. That was basically canceled right through until July of this year. Um, and it yeah. just, it's, it's hard to not think about that and, you know, realize you know what you have missed out on and these opportunities and the and the the people that you get to work with that are your road family essentially and you you know there's a lot of things that i miss for sure um but at the same time i i was like okay well what what's gonna what good can come from this and that is i'm home you know like in the last five six years i averaged less than 100 days a year at home so yeah. now I've been home for essentially like, you know, almost 400 days in a row. Um, and I thought, okay, well, what, what, I've got the gift of time here. You know, there's all these things that I've said I've wanted to do that I haven't had time to do or, you know, various projects and 
uh, courses that I've wanted to take. So that's what I did. Um, you know, I've taken three classes online to improve my photography skills. I've just done all kinds of research. And then the biggest thing for me is I, I wanted, I had to keep shooting. So I started revisiting that ravine, which, um, I mentioned, or was mentioned off the top that, um, is you know literally down the road from from home it takes me four minutes to walk there and i've got foxes coyotes deer waterfowl um just and, trying to get that up now just keep yeah looking at it. so so for yeah, me it was just one of these things where um okay this is all you know at my disposal and, and it's literally some of it is in my backyard like that rabbit you just showed <laughs> yeah um yeah. And, and all these other photos are all taken within two kilometers of home and um, all captured within this past year. So I, as I say, I just was like, okay, I have this little gold mine that that's right under my nose that it's something that I just hadn't focused on because I was so focused on, you know, all these exotic animals that I, I dreamt about photographing my entire life. Um, this is where I started out in this ravine as a, as a kid and hone my skills. And, um, you know, I, I, I just hadn't gone back there in the longest time. And what I love is the fact that it's, it's opened my eyes up to this little gem that, that, you know, this tiny little sliver of forest that is in the middle of the city. That's literally down the road from home that has all this beautiful wildlife in there. And, and, um, and I know one thing I've learned is that I will never, neglect this again i'll never take it um for granted you know it's it's something that i'll continue to focus on um for the rest of my days because it's you know and so i'm very grateful for the opportunity in the pandemic to sort of rediscover home essentially um you know and then not only that but take the the skills that i've learned in in these courses that i've been taking with post-processing and be able to have the time to sit down and and you know, kind of fine tune things and, and come up with what you're seeing here. Yeah. And they do have a look. One, one thing I, I love to talk a little bit about technique now, and then there's three images that are, are I want to, I want to highlight here um, because I talk about, I mean, they're so incredible and they, they certainly, you know, they have you all over them. Like you said, you're learning certain things about post-processing. I can see that there's elements of, of that in, in these images. I'm looking at them going, I don't know what you did, but, it's working, you know, <laughs> and I, I've done a lot of post-processing. So, uh, but I want to talk about reflections just quickly. Uh, this little lesson on these three images here. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I, as I learned wildlife photography, I was terrible at remembering to look or, or consider the reflection. And so it, in these three images, I noticed right away, clearly you, you see this, you, you have enough experience to know, don't cut the reflection off. And it, and it sounds silly, but it's, so easy to do we get so so focused on the animal Uh, you're you're absolutely right and i I mean i'm you know i'm just like everybody else out there um sometimes things unfold so fast in front of you as you say you're just focused on capturing the animal your your main subject um i'll never forget like i had an opportunity a couple of years ago uh, i think this was in 2018 in the arctic and we had three polar bears that were running across the the ice and there was some melt pools with that beautiful you know aqua blue water in them and I've got images of the bears leaping over you know a gap in the ice over this perfectly still mirrored aqua blue water and I've got half the bear cut off yeah. And it was because it, the bear's running, it's cut, hap, everything was happening so fast. And I'm just trying concentrating on the bear running and being in the middle of my frame. And it wasn't until after, you know, and I'm talking moments after you're looking at this image and you're just like, oh my gosh, what a missed opportunity. And I was crushed. <laughs> Honestly, I was crushed. Um, oh, I, yeah. I would say I missed out on one of the nicest photos I ever could have possibly made. Yeah. And that that was only a couple of years ago, but that really stuck with me. It stays it really with stuck with when that happens. And, and yeah. it, it was like a, a lesson, you know, to be learned from. And so now it's really in the, in the forefront of my mind, whenever I'm in these situations to, to make sure that I'm looking for that. Now, ironically enough, 
that uh, the deer picture here that you're speaking of, um, this came also as a result of a, a, a sort of a momentary lapse where the first time that, that this particular deer, the buck that you see in both these pictures, it's the same buck, um, Bucky uh, is what I call him. Um, <laughs> of course. So the first time that I crossed paths with Bucky at the creek, um, he came out and it, I had kind of walked around the, the, the bat, you know, a long way. And I, I crossed paths with Bucky and I thought, Ooh, I think he's headed in the direction of the Creek and he's going to cross. So I kind of doubled back. I had a 600 mil lens on me. That was all. And in the position I was where Bucky crossed, which is this exact point here, this is where I found out he would cross on a daily basis. Um, I was quite close for a 600. So I only have kind of half his body and I had just part of his legs. And I was like, again, I looked at the picture and I was like, no. oh no, what did I do? I missed this great opportunity. Still was yeah. a really nice photo. But my thought process was, okay, maybe this deer, you know, I went and looked after he crossed and I saw, you could see the traffic, you know, the route, the, the, where the, the deer trails are and the prints and tracks and things. So I thought, okay, I bet you he crosses here quite frequently. So that started out a six week journey to get these two images that you see here, wow. um, where I went back to this Creek every single day. I sat in my blind, I would go before dawn and be patiently wait. And I'd say, you know, four or five days a week, Bucky would show up and cross uh, almost at the same spot. So it, as I say, it took six weeks to get these two images. One was I think taken on July 7th and the other on July 9th. And I, it, you know, there was days where there was wind, so there wasn't a perfect reflection. There was days where there's so much debris yeah. on the water, I didn't have a reflections. Or uh, Bucky didn't cross at this point, he'd cross further down or closer to me. So it was a lot of trial, trial and error, but I knew if I put the time and patience in that eventually this, this vision that I had would come to be. And, and, and sure enough, the effort paid off. Yeah. And that's the dedication of the professional. Um, that's, that's what we're in it for is the patience to sit on a spot to anticipate and to risk, you know, failing miserably because we, we, we guessed it wrong or we didn't quite get it right, but it pays off when it pays off. It's, it's, it's massive. It's huge. It, it, pays it is. Off. It's, it, it was like that, that moment, you know, the, the first day where I got one of those images, uh, it was just such an emotional release for me. Like I did, I'm sitting in my blind. I got tears coming down my, <laughs> out of the corners of my eyes. Cause I was just so happy. At, yeah. You know, this was, this was something I would set out to do. I had this vision and, you know, and, and that, you know, you can, you can craft a shot to a certain degree, you know, as in like pick your location, pick, you know, and, and your time of day and everything, but there's no guarantees that, you know, the star of the show is going to show up when you need them to and in the right conditions. Yeah. So it's, there's, you know, as I say, it, there's a lot that's not in your control. And, and yeah. so when you do have a vision and, and, and you put the work and the effort, the time in, and, and then it does come to be, it's, it's such a satisfying feeling. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, St. Andrews uh, Bay, Antarctica, uh, trying to capture penguins coming out of the surf, like they torpedo out of the surf. When the, the tide is right and the conditions are right and the, the penguins are moving, I remember sitting, you know, you take thousands of images to get that one of that, you know, that penguins just coming out of the surf and the water's going everywhere. And uh, that reminds me of that, just sitting there on a landing, knowing I'm going to sit in this spot and I, this is where I'm going to be for the next four hours or five hours waiting. Yeah. And then it doesn't happen. And you say, well, I'm not going to get back here till maybe one or two years from now. Like it may not happen again. Like this moment exactly. might not happen again. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the big difference is, is like you mentioned going to, a far off land and, and somewhere where you know you A, may never get back to or B, get back to every few years and, and who knows what conditions will be. You don't know, you have no idea. You don't. With me and, and this deer situation, like this is literally down the road and uh, that was one major difference, you know, so. Yeah, um, and that speaks to exploring your own backyard. Like you said, I've also, I'm guilty of neglecting my own province where I kind of hone my skills because I've been going to these incredible places. And then you you forget you live in one of the most amazing countries in the world that has its own 
magic happening. Exactly. Uh, it's not all magic, though. Sometimes things don't go as planned. And I just want to kind of finish off toward that. And uh, you and I both experienced it. And um, uh, uh, the passengers of our, our ship experienced and many others. We were, we were waiting in, in, in uh, Longyearbyen in Svalbard. Uh, for a plane to come in and the plane came in and it landed and then uh, 20 minutes went by and a disembarkation happened and another 20 minutes went by and then an hour went by and I think there was an announcement saying we, we had to be patient or I don't know what they didn't communicate much but in the end after waiting many hours in the airport we discovered that and I have a picture of it there there was a what was likely the remains of a large snow goose in the uh, aileron flaps of the airplane um, that we were supposed to get on. And it was eventually concluded that they couldn't get another plane up to get us. And we had to go and wait it out or sleep in the airport or go back to the hotel or go back to town. And uh, that was disappointing enough, but it didn't end there. They did send another plane. We did get to get off that plane, but there was a mad scramble for all of the passengers through their agencies and their ticket holders and us as staff. And do we make our own flights? Do we wait for flights to get reassigned? That it took me three days to get home, but yours was even longer. What, what happened, Dave? Like we got separated in Oslo. I forget where yeah, we, were. we were. We were helping a couple of passengers kind of figure out where they needed to go at the same time, trying to not miss connections and we got separated at Oslo. And then I heard later that it took you a long time to get home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a crazy journey. It, it hands down the craziest travel experience of my life to date. And I don't know if I'll ever top that one, but uh, I hope I don't. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like it was just, it, there was so much uncertainty revolving around that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just nobody had answers, you know, like. No. Uh, the airline didn't have answers for us. Um, our connecting airlines couldn't do anything at the time because, you know, it was just, it was a mess. So um, yeah. we were kind of in the dark and, and, uh, but as you say, uh, like we were fortunate, we didn't check out of our hotels. So we were able to go back there and, and get a little bit of uh, shut eye in, in a bed and not on a luggage belt, like some others. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then when we got back there, you know, you're thinking like, okay, well now, you know, this is now 24 hours later. It's we're, the next day. It's all going to be sorted. We're going to yeah, go home. And you're like, okay, well, all right, we're a day late, but we're, you know, going to get home. And then, yeah, like you say, for myself, I got to Oslo. Uh, I was directed by someone to go this way to meet up with Air Canada. That ended up booting me out of uh, secured zone. <laughs> yeah. You got out of the airport completely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the person had misdirected me and then my bags were in where you were. And yeah, you, I think you had to end up bringing my bags to me. Yeah, I did or, end or, up bringing the bags out. I, yeah. I can't recall. And then that's where we went our separate ways. And I, you went on, I think to, to, well, through Montreal and I don't know if you had to connect yeah. somewhere else, but I had. Yeah, to I think I had. Through. I had one one European connection, and then I had an overnight, and then I had to connect through Montreal, and finally made it home. But when I got home, I heard you were still out traveling. in the wind and <laughs> traveling, and and I heard I heard news that you got to Iceland, and I thought, well, that's taking the long way home. How, what yeah. happened? So I I ended up in Oslo, and then and because my flight didn't show up, and good folks at SAS didn't contact my connector, which was Air Canada. Uh, Air Canada just thought I was a no-show, so they canceled my flights and um, <laughs> it, and basically had to start from scratch. And, and thankfully, you know, one of our, our fellow staff members was gracious enough to help take care of this stuff because I would have been lost without that um, and rebook flights like you know re you know right from scratch like yeah, i said right from zero and i ended up yeah. having to go through copenhagen and then on to um iceland as you say and i ended up having a 24-hour layover in iceland um which in 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 you know in a way it didn't bother me because i had an option yeah. of going through heathrow where i would have had maybe a i think it was like a, a eight-hour layover or 24 hours in iceland so i was like 
hey, I'm already taking two days to get home here. What's another one? So go somewhere where I haven't been because I haven't been to Iceland. So yeah. I got to uh, the airport in Reykjavik and uh, I, I remember laughing because they just, uh, there was, again, it was uh, just chaos there as well. Uh, I don't know. There was something going on there and, you know, I'd kind of wasted a bit of time in the airport getting no answers. And eventually somebody from One Ocean contacted me and said, just take a cab to downtown Reykjavik. I booked you a hotel. You can stay there. Uh, you know, just just do it. Just go do it. So yeah. um, I remember hailing a taxi and I, I can't remember. I think the taxi ride was somewhere around like the equivalent of between three and four hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> to get to, from the airport to my hotel i knew oh. i knew taxis were expensive there but i had no idea how expensive and um wow and just iceland in general because i remember that night going out for yeah. pizza and a beer and, and I meals that, yeah yeah it was like a hundred bucks for a pizza a single yeah. pizza and two beers and uh but anyway when i did get there the first thing i did when i got to my hotel was started looking up guides uh yeah. and i found a guy to take me out the crack of dawn the next day um, took me out in a boat to go photograph puffins. Puffins, um, because yeah, that was on my bucket list. I was saying I was so jealous because you're going to the puffins to get yeah, that shot. Yeah, so it was super cool to have that opportunity <laughs> and and be able to take advantage of being in Iceland just for 24 hours. Um, yeah. You know, I, I I basically got to see all around Reykjavik and then got the tour by water and, and got to spend a few hours photographing puffins and and then I flew out that evening and. Um, I ended up, yeah, having to connect in Toronto and then, uh, or no, sorry, I, I think I landed it. Sorry, I'm trying to remember now. I landed in Halifax and then from Halifax to Toronto and Toronto to London. And it was 86 and a half hours later from the time I left Svalbard to the time yeah. that I arrived back home. So, wow. um, yeah, it was quite the journey. And all my bags made it, which I couldn't believe. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's incredible because um, all the... I remember all of us thinking, how are we ever going to reconnect with our stuff? Like, cause yeah. we're getting bounced around everywhere. Like I'm pretty sure I did. I did go to Heathrow for eight hours. I'm pretty sure that's what happened to me um, in that, that whole fiasco, but yeah. 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 It was a mess, an experience. That's for sure. <laughs> it was an experience. It's always an experience. You know, when you're expedition cruising, I'm going to end with this. When you, when you're on expedition, there's always plan A and then there's plan B and plan C, and plan D, and plan E. You know how it goes. And almost never have I ever experienced plan A. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, you know, in all honesty, the first time, my first expedition trip to the Arctic was the one and only time I experienced plan A. We actually oh, wow. got through the itinerary, start to finish, on time, everywhere we wanted to go and see. Um, and And... Yeah, but ever since then, all those remaining trips, not not a single one of them has, you know, uh, yeah. been plan A. I always like a lot of the expedition leaders would say, you know, here's where we are and here's our starting point. Here's our finishing point. And whether we get to that finishing point is, again, another, you know, who knows? We'll find out when yeah. we get there. And then whatever happens in the middle, well, we've got A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But whether we get to those or not, who knows? It's an expedition, yeah. you know? And that's yeah. one of the things I've always loved about them is the unknown. Um, I'd love, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not one for routine. I don't like the same things every day. I love the, uh, the unknown. And that's, I guess, why I enjoy expedition life so much is because every day is different and you have no idea what you're gonna expect. You never know what's gonna unfold. Yeah, part, part of the story I tell is that expedition cruising actually uh, fed to uh, dramatic recovery in my mental health because you you live moment by moment. You stop having all these expectations about life, and you live moment by moment. And that that was just transformational uh, in my own life. And it's a That's way awesome that to I, I just yeah I can't wait to go back. And fortunately, uh, if everything unfolds well, I will go back to Antarctica in January. And uh, next uh, late summer, I'm I, I, I believe I have a. Iceland, Greenland, and uh, uh, Northern East Canada trip booked. But a lot of things have to fall into place before that becomes a reality. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, hopefully they do those things fall into place. So 
you can get back yeah. to that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And, and hopefully we cross paths again at, at some point in the future on some some trip somewhere, whether it's in the Arctic, Antarctica, Africa, or somewhere in between. Or, or Algonquin, who knows, you know? Uh, Algonquin, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's only a few hours away from me. It's right around the corner. You know what, I, I am embarrassed and ashamed to say as a professional <laughs> wildlife conservation photographer, do you know somewhere I have never been in my life? Are you serious too? I have driven through it on the highway. Oh my God. That's okay. It. So and it so is I embarrassing feel the to me to think that I've, <laughs> I've never been, you know, and people can't believe it when I mention it. Um, yeah. I, maybe we, this is something I think a goal that you and I should work towards and that it way we can ensure that we get to hang out together and we can shoot together and, and plan a trip together. Yeah. And I have, a, I have some people that live there and uh, this is all the more reason for me to be ashamed of not being there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Dave, I really appreciate you coming on. There's more that I would have loved to have covered, but I don't want to go too long. I know you're going to stay for some Q&A, but I just want to thank you uh, for, for being here and sharing with us just a little glimpse into the life of an expedition and wildlife photographer in extreme environments. There's more we could have talked about, sharks and whales and other trips, but we'll save that for another time. So thanks for Sounds joining good. us. How can people get uh, follow you, get in touch with you, share your what's coming up for you? Um, yeah, so there's my website, which is davesanfordphotos.com. Uh, the, the, the most active of everything, I guess, uh, on a daily basis is my Instagram account, which is simply my name at Dave Sanford, and it's S-A-N-D-F-O-R-D. -D. And, uh, and then there's my Facebook page, Sanford Photography, and I've got my Twitter account, Dave Sanford, and I've got mm -hmm. my TikTok account, Dave Sanford. Um, so, so there's all yeah, kinds just of to, platforms. Yeah, just to let people know, it, uh, uh, just you click Dave Sanford and start typing photography and it just fills the page. So you won't have trouble finding them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dave, for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure.